Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm uh, really honored and privileged to uh, present to you uh, the effects of dietary blackcurrant extract and omega-3 fatty acids on endothelial function and biomarkers of vascular health. As background, I'll start off with uh, the significance of this area of research and then talk a little bit about my previous studies, which led to this important area of research. And then finally, I'll describe the clinical trial that's underway. As you know, coronary heart disease does remain the leading cause of death in the United States and worldwide. And, you know, as the population ages, that will increase with time, and so it's expected to get even worse. The good news is there are studies that show that diets high in flavonoids and omega-3 fatty acids may decrease the risk of coronary heart disease. And this is primarily because the flavonoids and omega-3 fatty acids may improve vascular function and um, also inhibit some of the processes associated with atherosclerosis, such as inflammation and oxidative stress. Now, this is uh, where the main problem is. You've probably seen this slide at the poster today, but uh, in any case, you can see the timeline for the development of, of atherosclerosis and here with the various stages of progression. And so we have a cross-section up here, the coronary artery. See how wide open that lumen is at the beginning of uh, the first decade of life? And then as this progresses, it's almost totally occluded. So can, you can imagine what that does to blood flow to the myocardium. Um, the other thing that's important here is that endothelial dysfunction is one of the key initiating events in this whole process. And by that, I mean it's, it's injury to the endothelium or the cells lining uh, the vascular wall itself, so the endothelial cells. Now, this is thought to be triggered by inflammation or an inflammatory response to injury. And uh, usually, if it's a mild case, it can go in two different phases. There's uh, injury. If we look down the middle of the artery here and the injuries here, you can just heal it over with a small clot and some smooth muscle cells there to, to repair it. But in a severe case, and this would be primarily what you might see with repeated exposures to various risk factors, say if there's high cholesterol or smoking or high blood pressure, that injury is... is uh, continuous, and it'll progress to what we saw in the previous slide, so to a point where then it'll start to present in clinical syndromes, so unstable angina or uh, myocardial infarction. Now, this endothelium, which I keep talking about, is so important because it produces many factors and mediators which really maintain your cardiovascular homeostasis. So regulate your blood pressure, regulate your blood flow. And uh, one of the key or major ones is nitric oxide. This uh, nitric oxide really has several physiological effects that prevent that whole atherosclerotic process. So what can we do then to prevent and actually preserve our endothelium, you know, and have all of these uh, good factors in play? Well, we can eat more flavonoids, and the good news is they are abundant. They're in fruits and vegetables all abound, uh, especially in uh, uh, the berries and dark chocolate and even red wine in moderation. <laughs> Now, these flavonoids have a multitude of cardioprotective uh, effects that help preserve the endothelium. So they're anti-inflammatory. They lower your lipids. They lower blood pressure. They open up your arteries. They also have antioxidant properties, and they also prevent the formation of blood clots. So I'm going to take you back in time a little bit. This is where the story all began for me. I was uh, looking at an experimental model of hypertension, and uh, I was looking at the genetically hypertensive rat. They 
intensive does. And I wanted to see if plant-based nutrients would lower their blood pressure. So I gave them a diet rich in evening primrose oil, black currant, which you're going to hear more about today, and barrage, and also fungal oil. And I gave them this diet every week uh, for seven weeks and monitored their blood pressure uh, every week. And uh, that's a whole other story, monitoring their blood pressure, uh, save for another day. But anyway, this is what we found. If we look at uh, systolic blood pressure on the left-hand side here and on the bottom are the nutrients, and pay particular to this purple one, that's black currant. And at the end of the seven weeks, it had lowered blood pressure by 25 millimeters of mercury. So compared to the controls at 190, that was really remarkable to see. In our clinical trial, our new clinical trial, we're using an extract from the black currant uh, berries here as our nutritional in, inter intervention. They almost look good enough to eat, don't they? <laughs> Uh, the other thing we knew from previous studies is that the omega-3 fatty acids uh, found in fish and fish oil, including docosahexaenoic acid and eicosapentaenoic acid, were promising. They're cardioprotective. We knew from early studies in the Greenland Eskimos that had the lowest incidence of heart disease that they were cardioprotective. And it's primarily due to the high amount of fish and, and whale in their diet. Now, like the flavonoids, these omega-3 fatty acids have uh, several cardioprotective effects. And um, it's really due to the increase in nitric oxide from the endothelium. This uh, nitric oxide increases flow-mediated dilation, or it opens up those arteries. And in totality, if we look at all of these effects, it essentially improves vascular endothelial function, and it also prevents the development of atherosclerosis. So very powerful uh, nutrients, those omega-3s. We had also conducted uh, a study where we gave, uh, again, the experimental model of hypertension, uh, diet rich in docosahexaenoic acid for several weeks. And we were able, again, to monitor their blood pressure. So at the end of six weeks, this is what we found. Here is uh, systolic blood pressure on the left-hand side and time and weeks on the bottom. The turquoise line are the the control rats, and they're prehypertensive at a young age, and then over time they develop hypertension. You can see their systolic went up to 200 millimeters of mercury. But compared to those fed the docosahexaenoic acid, it lowered it by 35 millimeters of mercury. So this was very exciting, in addition to what we had found before with black currant. To make the story even more interesting, uh, we were able to look at the pathology of the coronary arteries in these animals that were fed either the control or the diet with docosahexaenoic acid. And each one of these represents an individual uh, rat. But um, here is the coronary artery from the control uh, animals as a cross-section. And you can see how thick that vessel wall is in the coronaries. And look how small that lumen is. So imagine what the blood flow would be to the heart in, in this particular animal. In this case, it's almost, it is totally occluded. So no blood flow there. On the other hand, look at the animals that were fed to cosexanoic acid. See how much thinner the vessel wall is and how uh, increased that lumen is? So that's a lot more blood flow to the heart, and which is more cardioprotective in both cases. Our next step was then to look at docosanexanoic acid in the uh, human model. And uh, this is part of the early study, which was funded by NINR for many years. And we're forever grateful for that. But we uh, gave uh, children who had hyperlipidemia uh, what was currently recommended at the time, and that was a low-fat diet or the National Cholesterol Education Step 2 diet for six weeks. And then at the end of that time, we gave them, uh, in addition, docosahexaenoic acid at 1.2 grams a day for six weeks. 
And we were able to look at their endothelial function by measuring flow-mediated dilation in their brachial artery. And um, if we look here at the graph, here's flow media dilation in percent on the left and diet and diet plus dicosexanoic acid on the bottom. Uh, normally, flow media dilation should be about 8 to 10 percent. Uh, these children at baseline already had compromised uh, vascular function. Their level was 6%. So they already had evidence of endothelial dysfunction at a very young age. And uh, we, the thing that was so interesting was the low-fat diet made no difference in their endothelial function. So we looked then what happened when we added to cosexanoic acid uh, to their uh, diet, and certainly we saw an increase by 2% of their uh, flow media dilation. So it restored them back to normal or where they should have been. So this is very important clinically because for every 2% increase in flow media dilation, there's a 25% reduction in future risk of cardiovascular disease events. In our new clinical trial, we decided to use PCSO54, which is a lipid extract from the green lip muscle, and it is green lipped, as you can see here. And anyway, they're raised off the uh, coast of New Zealand in the pristine uh, toxin-free waters. And uh, they're very interesting, or the fatty acids from these, because it's even more potent than fish oil and what we've seen in fish oil, because there are many other fatty acids in the lipid extract. And they've also been shown already to have anti-inflammatory effects in animal models as well as in human models of arthritis and also asthma. And we think that it's targeting the eicosanoid um, metabolic pathway or uh, also the inflammatory process. So two points where it's kind of a double bonus. And the good news is it's a safe nutrient without side effects and no fishy aftertaste, remarkably. And um, we were also encouraged by our previous vascular research on omega-3 fatty acids. So all in all, uh, the reasons why we chose to add this in our uh, clinical trial. Here are the specific aims of our study. We're determining the effects of black currant extract, PCSO524, uh, or the combination of both on endothelial function as measured by flow-mediated dilation of the brachial artery and arterial stiffness as measured by cardio ankle vascular index, or we, we call CAVI, as indicators of cardiovascular risk and atherosclerosis. And we're also determining the effects of these nutrients or the combination on biomarkers of vascular health, lipid levels, the fatty acid profile, and also the flavonoid profiles. And these are really to help us gain insight into the mechanisms as to what's involved with our uh, pathways uh, in the responses that we hope to find. Now, the study design is a randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind, crossover study design with three parallel treatment arms. Uh, the subjects or participants are fasting overnight, and we have visits every eight weeks for six months. Uh, endothelial function we be measured in the brachial artery by vascular ultrasound, and arterial stiffness we measured by our CAVI uh, procedure. You can see a little bit closer our uh, representation of our study design. And so essentially, we have 122 healthy subjects between the ages of 55 and 75 who will be randomized to one of these nutrients or the combination. And then they'll uh, wash out for eight weeks and then cross over to the alternative therapy. And then our primary endpoint is endothelial function. Here's our inclusion uh, criteria, essentially healthy older individuals with normal or slightly elevated blood pressure and normal or slightly elevated lipids, normal BMI. And these are vascular outcomes. We're uh, assessing endothelial function of the brachial artery by high-resolution two-dimensional ultrasound. And then the CAVI assessed by uh, Vaza Serra, the uh, CAVI instrument made out of Japan. 
And uh, this just shows you how we are going to be determining uh, endothelial function. Uh, we are using ultrasound of the brachial artery. As you can see here, the transducers place longitudinally on the brachial artery. And there are a couple of things uh, which are of note to mention. This uh, uh, methodology is considered the gold standard for clinical research in the uh, measurement of endothelial function. The great news is it's a non-invasive measure where we've even, you know, been able to use it in, in children seven years old. But uh, how much better is that than doing an angiogram where you need to cannulate the artery? So it's, it's, it's very effective. And the other thing that's good is that... Uh, the measurement, if there's endothelial dysfunction or an inability of your uh, endothelium to produce nitric oxide in the brachial artery, it correlates very well uh, in the coronaries. So if it's in the brachial arteries, it's in the coronaries. And um, I might mention, though, this technique is challenging. Uh, I have to admit, you need a high level of skill and training to do the, the testing. Um, you also need advanced ultrasound technology. And um, there are international guidelines for the preparation of our subjects, as well as the uh, testing procedures. Now, um, as I mentioned, we uh, are able to get an image of the uh, longitudinal view in the brachial artery, and then we place a blood pressure cuff on the forearm and inflate it super systolic uh, for about five minutes. And when you uh, release it, it causes a sudden uh, release of your uh, vasodilators, for example, nitric oxide, and you see a sudden increase in blood flow. And this is called hy reactive hyperemia. And so here you can see this a little bit more clearly uh, in the normal case uh, where here's normal blood flow uh, before we put the blood pressure cuff on. And this is a longitudinal view of the brachial artery, and here's the vessel diameter. Once that uh, blood pressure cuff has been inflated for five minutes released, this is what you see. Uh, nitric oxide's release causes abrupt increase in blood flow, as you see here, compared to normal. And you also see an increase in the diameter of your, uh, your artery. And I also wanted to show you what would happen if you have endothelial dysfunction or injury to the endothelium, which means you're not able to produce, produce nitric oxide as you should. You're not able to dilate your uh, vessel as you should. So you can see here there's really no real change in the uh, vessel diameter. So that's endothelial dysfunction. Now, this is our other vascular measure. Uh, you know, with aging, you tend to lose elasticity and your arteries become very stiff. So uh, this is a way that we can uh, assess the structure and function of the artery. And um, it also gives an indication of the risk uh, for future cardia, uh, coronary heart disease based on the stiffness. And um, it really measures stiffness from the aortic arch all the way down to the ankles. And we use pulse wave velocity, velocity which is a, the gold standard for the measurement of this uh, arterial uh, stiffness. These are our secondary outcomes we'll be measuring. Uh, we have various biomarkers of vascular health, and each one is reflective of a specific mechanism uh, in which may be involved, say, endothelial dysfunction or inflammation or vascular injury or oxidative stress. And so uh, these really will help us uh, have a little snapshot of what's going on uh, in the artery itself uh, by these measures. And they'll also help us understand perhaps where we're uh, or where the supplements are targeting at which level of, of various um, mechanisms. We'll also be determining uh, dietary and exercise patterns of our uh, subjects in, in our study with these various questionnaires. You know, we feel like we've already had some divine uh, guidance with our previous findings with black current and omega-3, so now we're hoping for that breakthrough. So 
maybe perhaps instead of precision medicine, we'll be looking at precision nutrition. So in other words, uh, we'll be giving the right nutrient, in this case, black currant or variations thereof, and uh, the lipic extract at, at the right patient at the right time. And we believe we're at the right time. Uh, this research is in line with the mission of NINR. Uh, we also have the advanced technology here uh, in ultrasound to conduct these studies here at NINR, as well as future studies where we can look at other patients or populations at risk for coronary heart disease. So uh, to date, uh, we've recruited about 30 subjects, so we're very excited about that. And um, I'd like to acknowledge our research team as well as our students and volunteers and our uh, collaborators at Tufts as well as uh, in, at the University of Guelph. So uh, again, uh, we're very excited about the future and are looking forward to the journey ahead. So thank you for your attention.